This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Thanks very much. I will, I will uh, uh, make my introductory comments extremely brief because uh, that la the last talk just perfectly teed up, what, what an amazing coincidence, uh, the panel here that's about to follow. And, uh, and I will just, uh, maybe I'll introduce everybody and then uh, uh, so they can just uh, rotate through and then if you could hold your questions for the end, we should have a lively uh, question and answer session uh, following that. So uh, we, have, uh, we have four, Wonderful people looking at sort of burrowing down to various parts of the battery storage questions, uh, starting with Jeremy Copperthwaite, uh, who is at Maxwell Technologies, David Eaglesham, who's at Pelion Technologies, uh, June Liu at uh, uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and Galen Stuckey here, uh, uh, the local guy from UC Santa Barbara. So uh, they are, uh, we are going to sort of do a, a quick survey of this, of this terrain. They're going to set it up for us, and then uh, we can plunge in and, and drill down to some of the specific questions following that, that uh, wonderful overview we had. So uh, Jeremy, you want to start it off? I'm sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. I was looking at the order of the uh, program. Maybe I'm looking at the wrong page of the program. Okay, well, well David, David can go first. And I can also... Uh, oh, okay. Okay, great. Either way, go, go fine with me. <clears throat> okay. Oh. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to do this one. Uh, no, I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, so if you were paying attention, I am Dave Eaglesham. So, uh, so um, yes, I'm Dave Eaglesham. I'm with uh, Pelion Technologies. Pelion's a company that was formed uh, a little over three years ago to um, pursue just one of the uh, thrusts that George was talking about. Um, so the company was formed around the notion that if you can just do something that looks basically like a lithium-ion battery, but do it with magnesium, you will double the charge. That gets you about double the energy density. It also gets you a vastly more abundant material set, um, so you can drive cost uh, more effectively. So, so I could stand here and talk about what, what Pelion's doing, but what the organizers asked me to do is to provide a broad survey of what are the cost challenges with the storage business at the, at the, uh, the big picture energy level. And uh, I'll try to do that in five minutes. I'm not sure that's uh, realistic, but we'll try. OK, so I want to begin. I usually begin talking about batteries with this caveat. So this is a, a uh, quote regarding uh, battery companies being a mechanism for swindling the public by stock companies. Um, this quote does not come from a disgruntled A123 stock holder but, or from an even less gruntled Republican uh, committee. This comes from this guy back in the 1880s. So, so with that as a background, I want to talk about some of these storage uh, market projections. So th this is uh, a hot topic right now. So there's a lot of uh, discussion around the growth of the grid market. Um, and uh, the projections here are phenomenal, and they're pretty near term, right? So people are talking about a sort of five-year horizon, $200 billion markets. Um, and most of them, there's a whole bunch of stuff. The first three things that you see there are, are triggered. Um, they're, they're all analyst reports, and they're basically leveraging this Electric Power Research Institute um, thing at the bottom which is a, it's a great report, it's, it's well structured, they sit down and they walk through uh, what the demand looks like. Uh, the figure at the bottom is that it's, um, 
This is the slide that launched 1,000 startups. So what it implies, well, let, me, let me just maybe walk through what the figure, figure means. So, so the, it's, here's the cost per um, kilowatt hour, and to the discussion that we just had, this is battery kilowatt hour, um, not, not electricity kilowatt hour. Um, so this says that at 650 bucks per kilowatt hour of capital cost on the battery, um, which is not that far below current lithium ion, there's a phenomenal amount of demand. So, so this is, uh, the, the, the VC guy, guys get all excited about this stuff. So this says if you can just be 30% better than existing lithium ion technology, you can open up a colossal demand. Okay, so, so the issue with this is that the way the Electric Power Research Institute constructed their pricing. It was basically based around 2010 market, and then they extrapolated demand from that. So, the next, so, so they took two things. They took uh, time of day differences, which are largely set by the fact that there is no storage on the grid today. So, so that's the time of day difference. And then they extrapolate the market based on, on renewable penetration and a whole bunch of other things. So, so this is maybe my, my single message here. So I want to peg a few kind of price numbers uh, in people's head. First, I want to do a quick translation of the discussion again that we just had. So 650 bucks per kilowatt hour of capital cost translates into something like 18 cents a kilowatt hour if you treat it as an equivalent generation asset and, and all the rest of the stuff. Right? So, so 650 bucks a, a lot of capex. It obviously depends on how often you're using a battery. It depends on how long the battery survives, but it's, it's roughly in there, right? So 18 cents a kilowatt hour, that's a generation cost. Now, if you compare your generation cost then with, with what, is, what is the actual cost to generate and the, the energy that we pull from the grid, uh, so base load is about 3 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, and in fact, the, that cost, that when the EPRI guys uh, built the cost model, they actually assumed that you're buying electricity at about three cents uh, a kilowatt hour. Combined cycle gas runs somewhere around six, depending on, on uh, how you run it, depending on how big the plant is, a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, compressed air energy storage, which is the only large scale storage option other than hydro that people use today, is somewhere around six cents also. Right. So, so I wanna, want people to sort of Think about these numbers, so 18 cents a kilowatt hour, and this is roughly gonna translate into maybe my single bullet, which is that these, the, the market is real, the demand is there, but the price points are gonna be about a factor three lower than what people are currently, what people are projecting from these uh, existing studies. Okay, so cheap gas, smart grid, I didn't, didn't really talk about smart grid. The smart grid obviously has the effect of, of increasing the flexibility on the grid and that drives down the need for some of these expensive band-aid solutions where you try to band-aid storage in. If you have a smart grid, you maybe don't need to do that and that's gonna drive the cost points much lower. Okay, one other study which maybe goes to the other extreme that I, I, I wanna maybe draw to people's attention. So uh, the Enrol guys did a, a study of renewable energy futures. This is, um, a cost optimized model with a goal of meeting 100% of electricity demand 24 seven in the US with 90% renewable penetration. So this is maybe a somewhat academic exercise, but I think it's a very useful exercise in terms of pegging our minds to the way that you can potentially solve these problems. So the way they, they solve these things, so they, they, they look at the intermittency on these various, or the variability in, in solar and wind and all these other things, and they basically design a system so that things are, are geographically distributed, and the, 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 um, as one goes down, the other one's coming up, and you, you basically generate a, a, a grid which has, um, uh, it has pretty much renewables coming on, so wind is coming on, the sun is coming off, and, and, and so on. Okay, in this model, they actually only jacked in something like 10% of total electricity demand is storage. Uh, and all of that, all that 10%, by the way, was all compressed air. The, um, the way they fixed the fluctuation problem is with transmission capacity. So to fix the transmission problem, you, 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 it's easier to transmit from a sunny area to a not sunny area than it is to store the electricity and, uh, and uh, pay it back later on. 
Okay, so I, w I want people to have this number in mind. Again, so 10%, if 10% of all electricity used in the United States was put through a battery, that's still a very, very huge market for the, for the, uh, for the battery market, but it's nowhere near as big as some of the other projections. Okay, uh, so what are the opportunities? So, so where are the real opportunities? That, you know, I, I think um, when, when we look at it, high energy density, um, this is it's maybe not very visionary, but there is an existing market. The existing market is very strongly driven by energy density. It runs about 15 billion bucks a year, and, and there is almost no system overhead, right? So you can minimize the system overhead uh, with that thing. If you wanna go after the grid storage market, I think, again, this is in, very much in line with, uh, with what uh, George is talking about. You really have to go after cell chemistries that have radically low materials costs. Uh, the picture on the right shows the sort of cost of goods sold. It's, a, um, it's actually built out of company uh, in, uh, returns. So you'll see R&D costs and SG&A and all, those, all that kind of stuff in there. The vast majority of the cost of goods sold of a battery is materials. So unlike photovoltaics, in which the cost of the materials, the semiconductor materials, is a very small piece of the cost of the, the module, in a battery, the vast majority of the cost of the battery is actually materials cost. So innovating materials around low cost materials is a critical piece of trying to drive uh, these overall cost goals. Uh, transportation, I think we all, uh, we all accept that. Safer chemistries, I, I think, again, George touched on this, but, but I believe that in terms of both of rate of adoption and of the, the qualification time for a technology, I think it's really terrific to be able to get away from the exothermic releases that are associated either with lithium ion or with uh, liquid sodium. And that, that narrows your opportunity space quite a lot, but I think that gets into a place where you'll have rapid adoption. Uh, last comment is high energy efficiency. So, so thermal management costs are a big piece of the system problem on these big batteries. So if you look at the, the total system integration costs of a large battery, uh, a lot of that is actually thermal management and, and raising the energy, energy efficiency of the battery is a way to get around that. Okay, so that's all I have, thank you. Okay, while my, okay, I'm Jeremy Copperthwaite and I'm from uh, Maxwell Technologies, so a little bit of a different angle um, from probably the rest of the uh, uh, speakers uh, here. Um, and uh, I'm actually a UCSB alum, so happy to be back uh, in the area. And I'll say before I start that I'm responsible at Maxwell now for uh, running a business that's focused on engine starting, which is uh, a good application for these ultracapacitors. See if I can get this. I thought I'd start um, by talking about uh, the basic application. Um, this is fairly uh, fundamental um, type of information. Um, so we, um, oh, stay near the mic. I forgot, I don't, I'm not mic'd up, sorry. Um, the basic application, um, you have a primary energy source, um, of course, and these are uh, typically, there's a need to over-design these to be able to supply the power um, as well as the energy needs of the application. On the application side, um, you have continuous power usage, of course, uh, peak power demand, and then there's some power in excess um, that can be uh, returned back to the energy source um, in a limited way um, through energy capture. When we bring in the ultracapacitor, things change. Um, first of all, we're able to uh, downsize the primary energy source because the ultracapacitor is able to handle the peak energy requirements. Um, the application side uh, remains, remains the same. Um, and also, because of the fast time constant of the ultracapacitor, we're actually able to uh, capture, have much better charge acceptance um, than under other energy sources. So we're able to capture um, more of um, the excess power uh, coming back from the application. Oh, okay, getting the hang of this. And this is this is the basic usage model for ultra capacitors. We have we have two uh, sort of fundamental features. 
Um, the first is uh, peak shaving. So, so basically, uh, we come into play when um, there's, a, there's a shortage of power available from the, the primary energy source. And the second is um, basically UPS application shown on the bottom of the chart, um, where we fill in the gaps um, from a UPS standpoint. I actually have one of our uh, products with me here. This is the, this is the main building block um, of all of Maxwell's and really the industry's um, products. Um, we are the leader in ultracapacitor, so it's hard to really talk about the ultracapacitor business without using our product to demonstrate it. Um, this is a 3,000 farad cell. It's a 2.7 volt um, cell. I'm sure an audience like this knows um, sort of the, uh, the, the, the fundamental principles of uh, activated carbon. There's basically 30 to 50 football fields worth of area in a, in a cell like this um, when you multiply it all out. Um, and the, uh, the, the differentiator with, with our cells versus the rest of the industries is that ours are made through um, what we call our uh, dry electrode process. Um, so this has a lot of IP built around it, and it's also very apl applicable to, um, to the battery industry, and we have a lot of interest um, from uh, companies making various types of uh, battery chemistries in our dry electrode process. A little bit about our uh, applications. Um, these are Maxwell's applications, um, as well as the uh, 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 worldwide ultracapacitor applications. Starting in the top left, uh, transportation. This is um, one of our biggest areas. So we are uh, present now in, in rail, uh, bus, hybrid bus, um, auto, and then also construction. Um, just to give you an idea of, of the, the size of, of the business, there are currently um, greater than 10,000 uh, hybrid buses in China with ultracapacitor uh, regen energy storage in place, um, and that number is growing uh, every day, <clears throat> and depending on how subsidies uh, come out in China, it will continue to grow at a, at a rapid, gra gr uh, rapid rate. Um, in auto, um, we're present in Europe. Um, this is in, in France. Uh, PSA has about a million vehicles um, on the road now with start-stop systems that are enabled by uh, capacitors. Um, these are uh, two 2.7-volt uh, cells that are uh, configured in series with a 12-volt uh, lead acid battery, and they come into play during a start-stop event. Moving over to renewables. Um, the biggest presence here is in wind. Um, there are ultracapacitors now in approximately uh, 25 to 30,000 wind turbines uh, around the world. Um, and a lot of those are in China, but also um, there's a large presence in Europe, too, um, of wind turbines, and it's really just starting relatively here in the United States. Um, also solar and, and various energy harvesting um, applications. Moving down to industrial, um, cranes, valves, uh, mining, smart grid. Um, these are all uh, areas where uh, ultracapacitors have a good application um, due to the power uh, performance. And then finally, on the electronics side, um, largely in uh, consumer, but in some commercial electronics, there's uh, greater than two, two to somewhere between two and five million solid state disk drives now. Um, that are out uh, in, in, the, in the field with uh, Maxwell ultracapacitors enabling them. Um, other applications are non-volatile RAM and also UPS. Of course, uh, UPS with the appropriate uh, time duration because we, um, we, again, are a power device and so we do have limitations in energy. Final slide. Um, Bottom right, uh, you can see um, a, our portfolio of products. Um, we have cells ranging from a farad all the way up to 3,000 farads, and then uh, modules that uh, range all the way from 16 volts to 125 volts. And these all get built into um, systems of varying complexity. I'm talking about the future, looking forward, um, there are three big uh, enablers, three big areas that uh, we're focused on in the ultracapacitor uh, industry. First is uh, increasing the energy density. Um, so we have uh, active uh, programs in place to uh, increase the energy density primarily through voltage increase. Um, 
but also also through uh, through capacitance uh, increase and and also packaging. Um, and energy energy density increases will lead to further penetration, we believe, in transportation. Um, there are uh, there are transportation applications currently, and it's been this way for a number of years, that have been uh, telling us that we really like the power performance of your device. If you could just increase the energy density um, a little bit, not, not, not to where batteries are, but, but a little bit, um, we would have much greater penetration. So that's one of our big foci. Um, power density, um, this again is, is, is voltage, and then of course there's a resistance term in the denominator, um, so ESR. Needs to, needs to come down also. Um, power density increases are going to really enable the consumer electronics market. Smartphones, pa uh, tablets, all of the mobile devices that the world has adopted now um, are all really, really thirsty for, um, for longer battery life. And um, we feel that uh, ultracapacitors, if we, can, if we can peak shave, the power requirements in those devices will give you much better battery life. And then, of course, we have continuous cost reduction. Um, so we have dramatically reduced the cost of these devices um, over the last five years as we've grown. Um, we've come from um, about a uh, uh, $60, say, material cost for a part like this to uh, well under $20. Um, we need to probably come down by not another order of magnitude, but we need to come down significantly still to um, generate uh, further penetration in what we feel is a very elastic market. And we, of course, have uh, programs in place, and I'm sure our competitors do, um, as these ultracapacitor firms pop up all over the world um, to come out with uh, much more effective uh, ultracapacitor power devices. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, the topic is different from the program because sometimes my secretary decides uh, what talk I should give. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to uh, talk about uh, some specific important issues we need to consider for both uh, transportation and great applications. So how this work? Uh, George and David give very good uh, introduction to energy storage program. So uh, I don't need to repeat many of the issues. There are two important areas. One is in the uh, renewable and grid application. Another is in the transportation. Uh, for transportation application in particular, we are really considering how do we increase the energy density of the batteries and the many other issues. So this I'm using this kind of chart uh, to show you that uh, now we're working on lithium ion batteries. Uh, that is probably good for uh, some of the short-term applications. But if you want a good, really increase the energy density, you need to go far, involving many other chemistry. However, uh, right now, even for transportation, in addition to the specific energy density, there are many, many other important issues we consider. One is safety. Really, I think the safety problem is the issue that can derail us by a number of years. So we need to take a very hard look at that. Uh, now I'm using this chart to kind of show why safety is a big problem in batteries. So this on the, I don't know how to make this work, but uh, uh, on the left hand side, we show the sort of the chemical potential of the electrolyte and also the other side shows the chemical potential of the electrode material. Top is the anode and bottom is the cathode. As you can see, if you look at the so-called NOMO and the HOMO energy level of the elect typical electrolyte and compare that with the uh, energy level of the electrode material, really, ideally, you want to be working within this stability window. Otherwise, you get into trouble. Now, if we use graphite, even graphite, uh, in the future, we want to use lithium. Uh, you are on the higher side. That means intrinsically, 
uh, you have charge transfer from the electrode material to the electrolyte, that really causes the so-called dendrite formation and the, the, the fire, those kind of things. You can have the same kind of issue in the cathode material. So uh, you can do not all things try to prevent this. You, know, you put a membrane there. If the membrane is not good enough, you put a ceramic on the membrane, try to separate the different components, those kind of things. But really, you are fighting against the thermodynamics. So uh, what we really need to look at is, are there any intrinsic ways to uh, solve this problem? So I'm going to give you two examples. Uh, one is, uh, if we look at the anode material, that's where you form the dendrite. Uh, thermodynamically, you always get this SEI formation, this dendrite, those kind of things. Are there any way you can change that situation so that if you form dendrite, it will appear, disappear by itself? So this is a kind of uh, a study that's currently supported by JCs that we are looking into chemistry as additives in the solution to uh, make the dendrite, those kind of things, to self-disappear, or uh, this is what we call self-repairing surface. I think those kind of new concepts uh, could need to much safer batteries. Now, in addition to niching chemistry, we can look at other chemistry that are intrinsically safer. So one example I'm giving here is the magnesium battery that is what Dave uh, uh, works on. Of course, we're thinking about magnesium battery that uh, you have two electrons and can get you uh, to high specific energy density and it's more abundant, all those things. However, another very important issue in this, again, this is partially supported by GHZ right now, uh, is that uh, magnesium, for whatever reason, is fundamentally different from magnesium. That if you, we have developed a few generations of electrolyte and electrode material, for this chemistry. Uh, if you look at the surface, we don't do anything. and It doesn't form the dendrite on the magnesium. So it's, you always end up with this very, very smooth surface. So those are the uh, two examples I want to give uh, uh, to uh, intrinsically make the battery much safer for transportation applications. Now I'm going to go to the uh, grid or grid scale or renewable energy storage. Now in this case, it's very complicated. So I'm using this sort of chart to show, compare the uh, energy storage for transportation, which is a very small uh, box on the far side. And the battery doesn't need to be very big. And then we are mostly considering lithium ion battery for that. We need to reduce the cost. But if you look at other applications, uh, the, the energy scale or power scale goes very, very wide range, and there's not a really a single uh, technology that will solve all the problems. I also want to point out, Dave kind of alluded to that, the cost requirement for different applications are different. For example, these are the sort of requirements for you to store the energy during the day and move it to night, do those kind of things. There really, you need the technology to be very, very inexpensive. But for other applications, like power application, frequency regulation, uh, uh, balancing requirement, those kind of things, the cost can be higher. And that was shown in the chart David showed that the, from the April study that the uh, cost the requirement for frequency regulation can be much higher. So there's not a single technology that we will use to do all these things. And other thing, dimension that I don't show here is that uh, all these applications, the, the performance requirement is also different. For example, how fast you want to charge this, charge the battery, how long you want to store the energy is also different. Here you need a, the charge, is charge time can be much longer. You need to store the energy for a longer period of time. But here, the frequency balancing requirement, the battery need to be charged, is charged much faster. So for those things, you are some of the uh, lithium ion batteries you can stretch to the power application, but it's not likely for the so-called energy, true energy storage sense. So if you go to the literature, there's a lot of discussion and debate or question on really uh, where energy storage is needed, how much energy is needed for what application, 
all those kind of things. More important, who is going to pay for all those kind of stuff? So this is a much more complicated story than the, just the, the uh, transportation that I need a better box to put it into the car. And so this is some of the studies sponsored by DOE that we published very recently. Uh, just do the, try to do the analysis carefully on exactly what we need to do. So in this study, we take the uh, western state. We started in the western state. We try to apply uh, to the old country uh, later on. And then we're just considering why application the balancing requirement because the, the problem is too big. We cannot do everything right now. And we, with, uh, uh, in the western state, if we uh, assume 20 gigawatt we should install the wind capacity in 2020, and this is an uh, amount of storage capacity we roughly need uh, for the western state, but just for the balancing requirement. So the market is there. Whether we do it or not is different. That depends on cost and many other things. And we did some other pretty interesting analysis associated with this. For example, for balancing requirement, uh, we can also analyze the capital cost of different technologies to see which technology can be suited for this kind of application. So for example, sodium sulfur battery, uh, super capacitor, flywheels, and uh, other technologies, even lithium-ion and redox flow batteries, might be applicable for, uh, in a number of years for the balancing requirement. But if we do the same analysis for uh, storing energy during the day and dump it to the wind, do those kind of things. Now, the, all these technologies are really, right now, too expensive. So we need to think about uh, uh, new ideas and new concepts. So what are the, uh, oh, OK. Before I go off on that, there's another thing I want to point out is uh, from the end user, you consider the energy uh, storage from probably different, slightly different uh, perspective. Even for off-grid application, uh, you, pour, uh, you can do things different. And here, I'm giving the Secretary Cho give this example of PV module cost in China. It really dropped so drastically in the last few years. And if you look at this whole thing, so in this package, that actually includes a battery, which is a net acid battery. Net acid battery is still 60% of all the market today. But even in China, they have close 90% of the manufacturing capacities. Now currently, the, for a typical home, the cost of installation cost of the PV is uh, uh, 25 or about $30,000 or so. In the future, it's going to go down below uh, $10,000 or so. So if you want to include a battery in this whole package, your battery need, really need to be less. For example, I'm showing out a random number. So the customer look at how much I'm going to pay today. You need to be less than uh, $1,000 probably. So what technology can you potentially do that associated with storing energy day and night? Uh, one uh, way to go is to go to abundant material. So this is some of the uh, work sponsored by RPE and the Office of Electricity we've been working on. So let's say instead of using lithium, let's go to sodium battery. So use sodium. So there are two approaches. The high temperature sodium battery that's supported by RPE. But really, uh, that is still need to be risky and uh, the cost is need to be higher. But if you can do make a room, so a room temperature sodium battery, you're probably much better off. So that's another thing we have been working on. And uh, now, uh, George already mentioned the redox flow battery. Now, the, the reason you work on redox flow battery is you get rid of the electrode and the many of the manufacturing issues. And the electrolyte can be very inexpensive. So the whole package can be very, very inexpensive, of course. The uh, limitation is that redox flow battery, the solubility of the active species is very limited. So that inherently increases the volume, the whole total cost, those kind of things. So what kind of things you can do to increase not only the efficiency, but also the energy density of the redox flow battery is a challenge. We have been working on that for a few years, and uh, this technology that uh, get a big investment, a new company in Seattle just to do that. So with that, I will stop. Thank you very much.
morning. Uh, I'm Galen Stuckey, and I, I'm, an, I'm the local boy. I like to hear that word at this stage of my life. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about chemists. I'm a materials chemist, and I, it's appropriate, I think, that I uh, do that. See, I guess I have to figure out how to make this switch. Which button do I push? Right button. There we go. I got it. So uh, the question is, still, we've heard a lot of story in energy, and one of the most efficient ways to do that is with chemicals. And as evidenced from this slide that you see here, whether you look at it from the volumetric or the gravimetric point of view. And uh, the, it, you, you don't get something for nothing, I've learned uh, over many years. In fact, and so you pay, you get energy, you have a lot of energy density, energy storage, but it costs you to make that. And the question is, what can we do in terms of using renewable energy sources to uh, c complete the cycle? That is, to, to be actually be able to, to uh, uh, do something about, and use a very abundant reactants we have to work with. We think of carbon dioxide and nitrogen, for example, as our, as our reactants. Uh, and it goes back to, there's two ways to look at this, and this is the one that comes back from natural gas flaring, where we burn 130 billion cubic meters of gas per year as of 2010. And uh, the, the one good news that's coming out is that that number is going down. And so the application, the idea of using uh, chemistry, for example, to reduce the CO2 concentrations by using renewable energy sources to do that, is, is a noble idea. It's very much in the infancy, but there's some major things that need to be considered as re regarding other things that can be done in parallel to that, and this, and this is one of them. It turns out, if this is looking at this, what's been done, there's about a 20% decrease as of 2010, so there's about a 13 billion cubic meter decline, and there's a, which is a 30 million tons of less CO2 that's emitted and six million cars off the road, and, and you can look at it at where we are, which is about 133 uh, uh, billion cubic meters that uh, we still have to, some, have to do something about, and that's 30% of the European community uh, consumption per year. So we still got a lot on, on mine. But looking at it from the other side, that is looking at how we can do something with electrocatalytic and photocatalytic production of chemicals, uh, our conversion of chemicals uh, in an easy way to, uh, so we can store electrical energy and uh, do the, produce the hydrocarbon uh, fuels and chemicals from CO2, water, and renewable energy sources. And so the, the, there's intense effort going on, and this is, I'm sure all of you know, through the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis, which involves quite a number, both uh, Caltech and also Berkeley, but also San Diego, Sanford, and UCSB are, are involved in this as well. And I'll say a few words about this, but this is what I just described previously is the uh, bottom line here is the goal, a cost-efficient method to produce fuels using only sunlight, water, carbon dioxide. And I'll say a few more words about that in, in this talk. A couple of questions come up as a chemist. Is what can you do? Can you make something out of carbon dioxide besides carbon monoxide? and other simple things, and the answer to that is yes, and this is some very nice work from Tom Haramio, who is a UCSB uh, postdoctoral uh, graduate student, actually, worked with Eric McFarland and also partly with me, uh, is now on, on the faculty at Stanford, and, and he's shown uh, just recently that you can take CO2 and electro, electro, using electrocatalysis, convert it into 16 different products. This is, a, this is, as far as I know, the world's record for what's available, including the simple monocarbon species, such as carbon monoxide, methane, for example, some of the ethyl, and dicarbon, ethylene, and so on, as well as some of the tricarbon systems as well. And he did it with a simple, relatively simple electrolysis uh, configuration, which is shown here and using GC as the analysis on it. And the, uh, the issues here, uh, and this comes from Whipple and his co-workers at the University of Illinois Urbana, who did a kind of data mining literature search uh, summarizing the energy efficiency. The alkaline electro the electrolyzers are for water splitting and the, the energy efficiency for that, which is uh, suitable, it's, it's, it's appropriate, about 70%. There was moderate uh, energy efficiency for the CO2 conversion, 
Uh, and it's easy to make carbon monoxide and, and formaldehyde, but it's a, it gets to be a problem when you're making the hydrocarbons, and primarily because of overpotential problems uh, with that. And, and, the, and this is a, another one of the, uh, just to illustrate from a chemistry materials catalyst point of view, uh, summer, summary again from Whipple, uh, where the problems are. And basically, we, want, we need to do something about uh, increasing the uh, energy efficiency. That's a major fundamental goal, of course, for the overall process, and also increase the reaction rate. And uh, both of these, in the end, depend upon having the right catalyst and finding that. So I wanted to say a few words about that. Uh, a couple of approaches, uh, one approach that we're coming to, you know, I, I, I was at DuPont for four years and I in a catalyst group there working, and, and one of the, we, 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 went, we went to the, the early, this was many years ago, we went to the early stages of doing high throughput experimentation, and, and the, the old chemists there laughed at it because they said this is because you don't know anything. Well, the fact is that's still true. We, there's a lot of things we don't know about how really to design appropriately a figure of merit performing catalyst or material, uh, for, and particularly in the systems configuration. So uh, one approach which is being, uh, which we came, out, came out from uh, Gifon and my group and, uh, and also has been uh, developed by uh, and it's currently being used at JCAP, and I'll say, and tie that in with in collaboration with JCAP, is basically using inkjet printing, and uh, where you can up, get up to eight different compositions, for example, which are shown here, and you can print them out uh, very quickly using, uh, as shown here, to make uh, screening, do screening. You can do photoelectrochemical screening, and this was a three electrode system, a really scanning probe device, which was developed at at, uh, at Caltech and JCAP, and uh, using a drop of electro electrolyte, each one of these little dots that you make, which can be, they can be nanostructured dots, actually, and, and as far as the oxide is concerned, they can be porous, maso structured, if you wish. And they, you can do, uh, you can get very, they're about one millimeter in diameter, you can get very fast, uh, about 5,000, you can get up to five, over 500,000 of these individual dots printed in about an hour, and, and typically in real life it's more like 50,000 that you do. So you have that many that you can characterize and make your library. In this case, it's a four-component library containing iron, nickel, titanium, and, uh, cobalt, uh, and cobalt oxides. And there, in this plate, plate there's about 1,800 uh, dots, and there were three plots, three that were uh, uh, three plates that were made in this in this example. This is uh, somewhat old. This was presented at an electrochemical society conference, which is indicated which is indicated here in, 19, in 2012. And things have progressed significantly uh, since then. But the point is that you can then look for systems and look for over potential problems. And this shows the printing of that and mapping out the figure of merit for some. OER catalysts, and you can look at it on the left side, it's a function of the position on the plate, and the right side, it's looking at it in context of the phase diagram for the four components, and then you can take slices, of course, to it as well. The blue is not good, that has the high over potential. The red, if you can find them, they're scarce. The yellow, green is much is better, and the yellow is good, better, and the red is the best, but uh, they're, as you can see, they're few and far between, but they still exist there. And there's variables in here, quite many variables in here which have to do with annealing. And these are deposited, of course, on a, a, a conductive glass uh, uh, a slide or plate. So just finally, I want to say a little bit about creating an autonomous unit uh, to do artificial photosynthesis. And this is, a, this is a from particularly uh, Martin Moskowitz and Eric McFarland here at UCSB really are the drivers behind this uh, project and have done some, I think, uh, quite remarkable work in uh, bringing this to uh, at least the prototypes and the models to fruition. And uh, the, um, the whole idea, of course, you're going to combine a photovoltaic along with a catalyst. You need an oxidation catalyst, you need a reduction product catalyst as well, as indicated on this slide. Uh, this was just just came out in nano letters. Uh, it's, it's uh, I guess, ASAP or anyway, it's available uh, if you would care to look at this. And uh, this is the, an example of, a, of an application. 
Uh, it, we took HBR for a couple of reasons. Number one is one part is the stability of this. That is, we wanted to make sure that we had we could create a system uh, involving the semiconductors or the what we needed, the PN junction system, whatever we whatever we wanted to use for that, and package it in a way that would give it have a long lifetime. And it does have a very good lifetime. Uh, we haven't done it for extensive lifetimes, but certainly 24 hours, it's very, or that period, it's very sustainable. And it, it gives about a, it gives about a 7% efficiency for conversion of HBR or HI uh, solution. So it's a rather corrosive electrolyte. Uh, there's good reason, we have reasons for doing that besides the corros corrosive issue. You can also oxidize natural gas with bromine and you then use that to convert it into fuels and to and to uh, chemicals as well. So uh, I think that's my I think that's my last slide, and I think that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to start by asking a number of, uh, of really general questions, uh, just to sort of broaden out the conversation a little bit, and then I and then in a few minutes we will open up the microphones because I'm sure people have more sophisticated, more technical questions than I do. But I but I'm I, I do want to sort of put this in the context in, in a broader context. I, I want to turn first to David and ask, you know, when you talk to the uh, the solar guys, you, you used to be a solar guy. They say, ah, storage. You don't have to worry about storage for a long time. It's not a showstopper for us. You know, nothing to see here. Move along, move along. And when you talk to, <laughs> and when you talk on the other side to people who are, you know, talking about renewables on the grid, they say, oh, it's impossible because there's no storage. So I guess you know, it, without and without storage, it's basically a dead issue. So w first of all, you know, sort of help me ground truth out. At what point does it become really a showstopper for? Uh, for renewables on the grid? So, um, so it depends which renewable, right? I, I guess the, the way I think of it as a solar guy, <laughs> so disclaimer there. So, um, so there's, there's sort of a 20 some percent difference between uh, day and night usage. So, if, so if you start from today's grid, you can bleed in something like 20% solar before you need to worry about storage. Um, if you look at the way the NREL study is sort of designed conceptually, they basically start by start with that 20% solar, and then for every um, megawatt of solar that you add beyond that, you jack in about a megawatt or so of wind to, to get the night generation. Right? And, and so if you design the system that way, then the need for storage is pretty minimal. Um, as you as you grow it, and that's and again that's the that's the thinking behind the uh, the annual study. Because the, the other issue is grid robustness, right? So the grid has to be robust in addition, and and I think that's adding um, from the utility perspective that adds some some additional need for um, for storage, depending particularly on how how the uh, the storage is uh, is implemented. Right? So. I think maybe one, one final comment. So uh, if you look at the penetration in Europe, um, where the penetration is really high, they have run into problems in Europe. It's become an issue. Um, but in the case of Europe, the generation is dominated by wind, and it's dominated by wind in the North Sea, and there are actually very weak links between the generating assets uh, in, in the north and the consumption centers, which are, which are much further south. Right? So, mm -hmm. So that's an example where you can run into trouble, but it's a largely a problem of design, in my opinion. Yeah, because I was, I was, because I, you keep hearing how much renewable Europe has, and they don't seem to be wringing their hands a lot about batteries. But I guess it's a, if it, it, it's a different story, clearly. So, yeah, June, yeah, yeah, June. So, it's a sound. Yeah. So the, I think uh, your question is not completely accurate because I uh, have interaction with uh, a few uh, major solar companies. Uh, they do want to consider the batteries for the uh, solar uh, PV they are selling. But the problem is uh, uh, they don't have good option right now. They just uh, stick with the net acid battery. And one of the companies, they actually, when they started, they set up another company to develop a, a different battery for the system. but then eventually the cost is too, too high for them to really get in the business, so they, they just went back to net acid batteries. So if you can really develop 
uh, a technology that's uh, sort of comparable to net acid battery, that would be very useful. Yeah, yeah. so how much would that reduce the need for grid-wide storage? If, you, if I can put this in my house, that was a very intriguing slide you showed. If I can just the, put this the, in my right, house right. and say, well, then maybe, yeah. the, maybe the grid, does the grid at some point just become irrelevant or grid storage? Not really, because depending on where the market is, how you're going to use it. If you go to China, right, you can do the calculation, the setting efficiency of your solar panel in the high-rise buildings. You cannot, there's not sufficient space for you to have uh, individual solar panels for each apartment. Then you have to go to the uh, sort of solar farm, those kind of things. So the marketplace is uh, slightly more complicated than uh, in our mind as a <laughs> scientist. So really, you, you have to consider how it's going to be implicated. Yeah, and uh, and uh, let me ask you, Jeremy. Since uh, this is this is the first time I've seen an uh, ultra capacitor, and I barely even I've heard of capacitors as you know little parts on 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 c chips, you know, on boards and so on. But I always thought that was just a tiny flash of of power, and that was it. This must. Could could you give us a feel for how you know over what period of time this could discharge and provide power, for example? Uh, well, so I guess first of all, just to put it in perspective, um, I think we're when we were in our. Uh, in, in college and, and learning from textbooks. And actually, even today, the, uh, the students that I hire out of UC San Diego at Maxwell, um, they think of capacitance in terms of you know, micro, pico, nano um, types of ferrets. Um, so this is obviously 3,000 3, ferrets. So it's, so it's a much, much, much um, larger amount of energy. Um, and and uh, But, the, but the, the discharge, we, we typically say that we um, we have, a, we have about a half to a one second time constant, um, just to give you a, a, a feel for it. And, uh, and we typically go into applications that, um, that run for anywhere from zero to 30 seconds hmm. kind, of, kind of time frame, um, which is part of the reason why we need to uh, increase the energy density in these things so we can actually extend that um, further for like transportation applications where they want to sail um, in, in mild hybrids or um, or just have better efficiency in mild hybrids. And so, uh, so how much smaller can you make an automobile battery if you if you don't have to worry about that peak? I guess one of the things is, is is that real crank. Your car doesn't. If your battery is not doing well, you won't it won't crank over, right? Because that's the biggest demand is getting the car to start, right? So how, yeah. if you get these things to work uh, for you know if this becomes fully integrated into cars, how much how much less juice do you need out of the battery just for running sake? You, you typically, so, so a typical um, uh, sedan passenger vehicle um, today, if, if you take out the, the micro uh, or mild hybrid aspect and just look at a basic car, it's got typically a 50, 50 to 60 amp hour battery um, in it. Um, we have, uh, or in, in my labs in San Diego, we've, we've built um, uh, hybrid uh, lead acid ultra capacitor replacements, and we're finding that the, um, that the amount of uh, lead acid you need is about 30 to 40 amp hours. Um, so you can shave off, if, if, they're, if you're 50 to 60 with, without the ultra capacitor, you can shave off maybe 30%. Um, hmm. and, uh, and, and, and that's without, the, the big, the big trade-off in, in, in hybrid devices with ultra capacitors is whether or not uh, you put in uh, management electronics or not, or if you just let the natural uh, ESRs of the relative components uh, dictate the current delivery. Um, of course, if you add in electronics, the cost goes up and it becomes more difficult to penetrate. Um, so, so I'm talking about basically just a straight uh, parallel hookup. Um, you could basically take about 30 percent of the lead acid out. But that would be but for a uh, for a conventional car or for a hybrid also. Uh, well, I guess hybrids aren't really lead acid. But well, they, they divide they divide hybrids up into a big uh, spectrum. So, so they start with micro and then go to mild, and it goes beyond that. So, mm -hmm. micro a micro hybrid is basically a vehicle that has uh, start stop, um, and then depending on where you draw the line, either micro two or mild uh, hybrid, you add in uh, regen uh, capabilities, typically from the alternator, and then later from um, traction motors on the on the in the drivetrain. So I'm talking about a microhybrid that just has start-stop, no regenerative capability. And Galen, let me ask you a question about uh, materials. 
I, just as a total novice in this area, how much, I mean, we heard that, that earlier presentation about, you know, all, you know, really making phenomenal progress in a very short period of time. How much of that is dependent upon just dealing with materials we know all right, or just, or really is it finding whole brand new materials that we are, that we are totally, uh, that, that we have to re really discover? That's an excellent question. <laughs> now the answer is that, you know, I really uh, believe quite strongly that the Battery Hub and also JCAP are on the right track in the sense that uh, when you design, when, when we design materials, the, as you know, the synthesis side, we can make pretty much, we have a lot of freedom what we can make, but the question is, are we make, you know, is it the right thing? And the question, it's not only what the composition, of course, and, and the structure, that's, that's important, but it's not the issue. The issue is really the performance at the end and how, what you get in the, in the, in the, in your supercapacitors or whatever you're trying to make. And so, uh, I didn't talk about this, but I mean, uh, built into what's uh, that approach in terms of making materials, there has to be good data mining, which is our, our NALSO modeling, uh, which is described and which we're fortunate to have at, at UCSB, but particularly it's emphasized strongly at, at, at the hub and also at JCAP and other places. And, uh, and also, uh, the thing that I is very, in my own personal, even down to the academic uh, synthesis or materials perspective, that uh, it's absolutely essential to look at, uh, take a systems approach to what you're doing in terms of the chemistry, but also in terms of the properties, which are, the properties are multi-scalar, multi-dimensional as well, and so you're trying to integrate those at the same time. Yeah, the, the genome analogy is interesting. I hadn't heard it before. It's, it's intriguing, but uh, we also have to remember that once we even, de you know, got a good sense of what the genes were in the genome, that didn't actually end up opening doors as, as rapidly as we thought, so it sort of gives one pause. Yeah. Well, I'm, the genome, I think it's a, I think conceptually it's a good idea. I have, I have some concern based on experience of the time scale that <laughs> some people have put into that, like three years from concept to market, that's, uh, or five years even, that's, uh, that's pushing it from what I know and my experience has been in industry and elsewhere. But yeah. the times are changing, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Junior. Sorry, I... Please. Yeah. Really, thanks. Uh, this is a very important question. Uh, in addition to discovery of new materials, another thing, my, my background is like again, and I'm a pure material scientist. Nowadays I talk about batteries. But a uh, very important issue is not only the material, but how different materials work together. It's more like a system problem. That's where there's a huge gap between like, for example, the battery field and the materials community that I try to bridge the gap on in the last few years. I can give you many, many examples on, we have one fantastic material, but there's no place to put in in the system. Like in batteries, we have some pretty nice, for example, high voltage uh, spinel cathode material that increase the voltage, but what is good if you don't have an electrolyte to go with it, right? So that's a big problem. I can give you another example. You go to the literature, many papers in Science Nature about some exceptionally high capacity, super capacitor electrode material. So you ask the question, if that's so good, why Maxwell is not using it, right? So you, if you look at that, thing is you look at this material, think about, hmm, what I'm going to use as a counter electrode? How am I going to make a device of it? It doesn't add up. So that's the gap between the community, uh, materials community and the technology that we really need to cross the boundary to make things work. Hmm.